Welcome one and all to this conference on social vision, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's transformative paradigm for the world. This is a forum for ideas convened in an unconventional manner in an unusual time. Doomsday prognostics abound concerning the virus, the economy, and the very fabric of our society. But not here, not around our Zoom table where we have gathered for Chachma to study, for Bina to discuss and extrapolate, and for Da'at to activate these novel and bold ideas in practical ways. We have gathered with a clear knowledge that this moment in history beckons with new and heretofore inaccessible opportunity we dare not turn our backs on. Moreover, there is a positivity and a forward-looking enthusiasm that virtually jumps off of the pages of the Rebbe's Torah and saturates his worldview, from which we can all personally and certainly universally benefit greatly. Now, those less familiar with the vast corpus of the Rebbe's teachings might see this so-called positivity bias as a ploy, as a facile, feel-good product that can be easily peddled. But the student, and it need not even be an astute student of these writings, will surely have noted how in the Rebbe's Torah, and here I quote Wexler's words, every form of adversity, no matter how painful or catastrophic, harbors within it a positive telos. As was his way, the Rebbe developed his thesis on a foundation of references to Torah texts, both exoteric and esoteric. For instance, as Wexler notes, the Rebbe's many references to the Talmud Yerushalmi's teaching concerning the birth of Mashiach, the Messiah, on the very same day that the temple was destroyed. Or the Rebbe's comments on the prophet prophetic words of Mika, in which the prophet predicts the destruction of the temple using the words, Zion shall be a plowed field. In his unique reading of, this wor of these words, the Rebbe highlights the evocative terminology of a plowed field, teaching us that this means that the ruin itself has the advantage of a plowed field. It is destined for sowing and growth. Now these referenced events, the destruction of the temple and conversely the birth of the Messiah, it can be argued, are all safely within the agency of the divine. But what of the evil and destruction planned and executed by human beings? What of the ways in which each person, each one of us, might stumble inadvertently and even in deliberate fashion as we walk the path of life? Is there any glimmer of light to be found therein? Indeed, the most audacious and radical iteration of the idea that in all misfortune that can be found the roots of its reversal is the Rebbe's vociferous insistence that even the premeditated negative actions of an individual, something they choose to do in explicit contradistinction to God's will, something that is surely not lefi haratzon, according to God's will, must still be, the Rebbe insists, lefi hakavana, in accordance and in consonance with God's overarching intent and schema. Nothing, explains the Rebbe, can occur outside of the purview of the Hashkacha El Yonah, the supernal oversight and consent. It must therefore be that even evil actions are essentially good and part of the incremental progression towards the fulfillment of the ultimate plan for the world that must crescendo not descend in apocalyptic fashion, but crescendo in redemption and wholeness. In the few minutes I was given, there's no time to delve into the Rebbe's explanation as to how this concept does not negate freedom of choice, which is a hallmark of the human experience and axiomatic to Jewish theology. I urge those further interested in the confluence of these ideas to study the Rebbe's teachings on the portion of Lech Lecha in Genesis found in the fifth volume of his collected talks, the Kutei Sichos. Suffice it to say at this moment that the Rebbe's absolute insistence on the essential positivity in every single action and occurrence 
even those actions and occurrences that present as completely negative, is a clarion call, a summons to us to view the world around us and every aspect thereof in a completely novel way. To see, to really see and apprehend, not through rose-colored glasses, but with eyes wide open, the profound truth that not only is opportunity born of necessity, not merely is the ultimate delight and luminescence of a new utopia built out of destruction and darkness, but rather that the very first moment of exile and obfuscation of the divine already heralds the ever greater revelation that is to come with redemption. And there is no moment in the entirety of the continuum that is random, wasted, or outside the confines of the trajectory of ultimate goodness. Maimonides, the Rambam, in his Sefer Chakira, employs a metaphor of a person walking eastward while on board a ship traveling westward. Although the person's own movement is taking him towards the east, he is nonetheless in reality traveling towards the west at that very moment. The Rebbe used every possible opportunity to remind us that even as we are all, as a universal society, involved in disparate overtures, we are aboard a huge ship we call this world. We are all being moved inexorably in a certain direction. He sought to orient and reorient us to this reality, all the while not cutting down our own agency, creativity, and individuality. The Rebbe urged us to shift paradigms, think out of the box, to change course so that we could be facing with full and intense focus in the direction of the ship's ultimate destination. And perhaps more than anything else, he taught in his public speeches, in private communications, and in his every personal encounter that we are all aboard one ship, all of us together, a single collective. This conference, it seems to me, is exhibit A. It's a confluence of personalities, disciplines, and orientations. May our gathering be blessed from above, and may our work together merit to be a blessing for many, many others. Thank you. Thank you, Rivka. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Moshe Gray. I'm the Chabad Shliach to Dartmouth College, uh, and I will be moderating this session. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, and mention especially Rebbe Nachum Schmidt, who was uh, a driving force, and all of his team that have, have worked so tirelessly to, uh, to make this, um, this uh, symposium uh, a success, hopefully. Um, it's it's uh, also very wonderful to see friends and faculty members of specifically of, of Dartmouth College, uh, Professor Lewis Glinert, who has been our faculty advisor for 17 years now, um, Shoal Magid, uh, and then friends, Lair, Dr. Schiffman and uh, Dr. Lowenthal, who are here also. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, um, just from the, wanted to share one thought from the perspective of, of somebody who, along with, with my wife and children, we've dedicated our life to this ideal. Um, in reading the book and, and obviously learning the Rebbe's uh, teachings in Torah for, for my entire life, um, the idea of excellency um, that the Rebbe presented, demanded, taught, uh, is something uh, so very central to the way the Rebbe, the Rebbe led and, and, and educated for, the enti for his entire life. Um, the Rebbe always, with, with a gentle guiding touch, inspired and challenged everybody who, who came into contact with him to be better than they were uh, the minute before. And when they came back the next day to tell the Rebbe how they fulfilled it, the Rebbe would, would, with a big smile, say, that's wonderful. Now we have to even be more excellent. Um, and you see this in one example with the idea of Tzedakah, where the Rebbe, in, in, in the book, uh, they talk about um, how the Rebbe would, would, would almost take Tzedakah and turn it on its head. 
that both the giver and the receiver are both simultaneously givers and receivers. They need each other. There isn't a power dynamic here. Um, and that in order to come to that true level of excellency, it's not enough that the giver gives to the receiver and the receiver helps the giver, but that a third person needs to benefit from that, from that uh, meeting between two people. And without a third person benefiting, uh, we, we don't come to the ultimate level of what Stucca really demands from us. And the Rebbe just didn't, didn't just teach this, obviously. The Rebbe uh, acted this out every Sunday uh, towards the end of his life. Every Sunday uh, when the Rebbe would give out dollars, um, not just to give a blessing uh, and often receive blessings back, but that a third uh, should, should benefit greatly. Um, so I find that this idea of excellency is being all over social media today with, with the civil unrest that we're seeing um, and demands from people who want to be recognized, um, want to be an equitable partner um, in the future are demanding excellency. And so we, 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 we have this, this, this road um, laid out by the Rebbe um, and so I'm very excited to hear from all the different panelists um, th this, how, we, how we're going to get there in, in all the different ways. Uh, I'll introduce each panelist as they, as they come along, but to start, uh, it, it, it's rather exciting and, 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 a, and a deep honor of mine to, to present uh, Dr. Benjamin Selznick. Um, Dr. Selznick is one of, one of our original students uh, at the Chabad House at Dartmouth College. Benjamin graduated Dartmouth uh, in 2007 uh, and has been a, a, a leader of our alumni uh, group ever since. Um, and is, is, as you'll see, is, is, is now you know, teaching and, 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 and mentoring and educating in this, in this path. Uh, Dr. Selznick is an assistant professor of post-secondary analysis and strategic leadership at the James Madison University. Uh, his remarks will focus on spirituality in higher education. Ben. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, and welcome and, and thank you to <clears throat> Rabbi Gray uh, and Rivka for those uh, very inspiring uh, initial remarks, which I think set a very positive tone uh, for the session. So I'm gonna quickly uh, share my screen uh, here, if you'll allow me to. Uh, and deliver my uh, remarks here. Um, so as, as mentioned, right, um, my uh, remarks today uh, on the theme of spirituality and modernity uh, are gonna really focus on college. Uh, I study higher education, uh, I study leadership in higher education. Uh, and as I'll talk about in a bit, I've recently uh, been afforded the opportunity to be part of a large scale national study of college student experiences uh, with faith, with interfaith, with those, um, with those uh, forms of the college experience. I'll talk a little bit about what that might mean for, for, for Jews and Jewish students uh, and, and how that kind of um, is aligned with some of the messages and lessons um, developed in, in the book. Um, so to begin, we, we might think of college, um, especially your traditional kind of undergraduate 18 to 24 population, but it can be for everybody. Uh, but we might think of college as somewhat of a unique spiritual location. Um, in another book um, on the Rebbe, and if you've read, looked at the Rebbe's kind of writings and thinking about why Chabad on campus in the first place, this was very acknowledged that having a place and a space for Jewish students to go to feel connected to their campus through their Judaism, uh, that their campus was recognizing of their spiritual and religious development during college, uh, and that the Chabad house, it was, as Rabbi Gray mentioned, it was for me, uh, could could serve uh, for, for, for generations as that location. Uh, college is this location, right? And we might think of it in two dimensions. Uh, one is the social piece, uh, which is challenged these days uh, in the era of distancing, uh, but certainly being able to form communities, right? Uh, communities for students when they're on campus, as well as intergenerational, so as an alumni working with students, right? Uh, and this can be in observance, this can be in, 
unstructured watching sports. I mean, it can be the opportunity to kind of have these kind of social engagements out of which learning happens. Uh, and certainly college, uh, again, uh, touts itself rightly as a really strong developmental opportunity. So students' brains are developing, right? They're learning a lot. They're trying to absorb a lot of information. They're also kind of, uh, in many instances, coming from their home communities and trying to figure out who they are, what their identities are. Uh, in our space today, uh, what being Jewish means to them. Maybe they don't identify as Jewish or they identify in some context as Jewish and, and, and helping them get a better understanding of themselves as Jews. So college uh, can be, and, and, and evidence discusses that would, would strongly suggest that college as a location uh, for spiritual development is really thriving on these social and developmental uh, and certainly those happening in concert with one another. Um, so I wanted to briefly touch on this idea uh, of the modern campus from a Jewish lens. Uh, and this comes from this larger scale uh, study called the Interfaith D uh, Diversity Experiences and Attitudes Longitudinal Study. Uh, it, it's a partnership of a couple of colleagues, my former advisor, uh, as well as the Interfaith Youth Corps. And it really is like a 120 uh, schools across the country, 7,000 students over the long term of it. Uh, and it looked at students at the beginning and the end of college to try to understand their experiences. And so some of what they found, uh, the good news, um, and again, I think this speaks to uh, the, the, the question of modernity. 84% uh, of the students, of Jewish students, there were about, about 150, 200 in that sample, but again, there was a much larger group uh, of students at large. 84% said Jewish, they, they do a place for Jewish expression on campus, which is good. I think that bodes really well for Chabad houses and, and Hillel and, and other organizations. Um, but only 27% said that their campus was welcoming for their religious diversity. And again, if you read, interpret that in the message of the book, right, uh, these can be opportunities for what we might think of as support from the home community, from the Jewish community, but also challenge and reconciling those challenges uh, and trying to navigate through some of that discomfort, which points ultimately back to kind of college as this social and developmental opportunity. Um, we also looked at every, we looked at Jews, but we looked at the entire uh, group of students on our campuses, right? And this was across all campuses. And so we wanted to know in the study, um, and we've written a couple papers on this, what supports the development of appreciative attitudes towards Jews? So uh, anybody else on campus, if you say, you know, are Jews making a valuable contribution to society? Are Jews moral people? These kind of questions. Uh, and what supports that for, for, for students? And we see some interesting interesting findings that I do think speak to some of this language of reciprocity, right, to this language um, of resacralization that we, we see in the book. And so one is kind of having space for support and spiritual expression. So not just Jews, when everybody feels like they have space for support for their own forms of expression, that, um, that, that broadly uh, promotes attitudes towards Jews. It helps uh, others kind of see um, themselves and the other, others and themselves, those, those kind of languages, these kind of social exchanges. So what's really interesting is when we have these kind of formal social exchanges, right, mediated as discussed in the book through speech, through action, through coming together, uh, when we have these social exchanges, that benefits attitudes towards Jews. Again, I think uh, having, um, you know, uh, Rabbi Gray once told me a um, long time ago that just being on Dartmouth campus and walking around um, as a Chabad rabbi was, was being beneficial to Jews, was, was really being, putting a public face on it. And, and I keep telling him 15 years later, the data proved him exactly right. Uh, he was exactly right. Just being there uh, and being a um, proud Jewish identity and engaging with others uh, benefits attitudes towards Jews broadly. And the final, uh, again, touching on some of Rivka's remarks is these kind of provocative encounters. So encounters that make you think, that make you challenge, that, that encourage students to see that things aren't exactly as they were at home, right? That they might be uh, growing and developing in new ways. All of these experiences kind of on average support broader appreciative attitudes towards Jews, right? Um, and so to, you know, uh, to tuck this into uh, to some of the themes of the book, um, the first uh, here is that we see, right, you know, on page 162 in the chapter on education, you know, that uh, the Rebbe argued that education is transformative gateway through which broader challenges can be overcome. And I think in the space of college, if we think about college as that 
uh, educational uh, space, right? Uh, this this bears out in our data, and it hopefully bears out some of, in some of your own um, experiences, right? Uh, that it can be transformative, right? We one part of college is that we hope it is transformative, right? Um, that students leave not just knowing more, but being different and learning more and being able to engage differently than they were prior to college, right? Uh, and so I think that ties in nicely with some of the themes in the book uh, and kind of this, the, to kind of broaden it out, you know, uh, very far out, right? This, um, this idea that like the college student is a multitude, right? So this idea of the individual as a multitude is a theme running throughout the book. And so if we think of that individual as a college student, right, especially a, a young away from home for the first time developing, trying to find their footing, right? If we think of that student as a multitude uh, and that what they learn and experience, whether they're Jewish or not, but in our instance, you know, certainly working with young Jewish uh, students, um, that, that they really touch the lives of many, uh, that what they learn in our in Chabad houses uh, and in their classes and kind of in social experiences uh, and what they learn about themselves as Jews um, and what others learn about them as Jews, right, uh, can be very important to creating uh, and hopefully uh, establishing through action uh, some of the social vision, this, this positive social vision uh, that, that Wexler and others uh, articulate in the book. And that's, that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, so we're gonna do, the, the way that this will go is we'll, we'll do Q&A after all three, obviously, uh, presenters present. Um, I, I was remiss in mentioning that the topic of, t of this morning's session is spirituality and modern life. Um, the, our next speaker is uh, Chava Green, uh, and she is a doctoral student at Emory University and a fellow at the Tom Institute of Jewish Studies. Her remarks will focus on Chabad's, Chabad women's Torah study. Um, one more comment is that if people start having questions uh, and they just want to get them in, feel free to put them in the chat, and once we get to Q&A, I will... Uh, I will, I will use those as, as part of our discussion. Uh, there's actually the Q&A thing, like oh. section. If you put them in there, that, then we don't have to transfer it over. Perfect. Kava, all you. All right, great. Thanks so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this conference and to be speaking on this panel. I was excited to see I'm on a panel about spirituality and modern life because uh, as much as I love learning Hasidic texts and learning about um, Hasidic philosophy, my real interest is how they impact lived experience, uh, which Ben spoke about so nicely. My talk is entitled Chabad Women as Moral Agents and Social Visionaries. My presentation is in conversation with a short yet powerful section in Social Vision about the Rebbe's perspective on the role of Jewish women in society, which Wexler entitles Women as Agents of Social Change in America and Beyond. There, Wexler refers to the Rebbe's teachings about how Jewish mothers specifically can have a wide influence on children's education worldwide by how they choose to educate their own children. This is in relation to Wexler's overall focus on the relationship between the individual and society. Here, there's a particular emphasis on the Rebbe's teachings about the transformative power of women in the public sphere. I'm interested in the ways Chabad women want to influence society based on Hasidic values, while at the same time, they themselves are subjects of a liberal, secular, Western worldview. A large part of what this process involves is understanding their role as Jewish women within the framework of feminism. I'd like to begin by sharing a vignette from my ethnographic research that will segue into some of my theoretical claims. I was part of a women's Torah study group, a Chavrusa, for about a year with four other Chabad women. They were all shlochos, meaning emissaries of the Rebbe. We spend one morning a week learning all different mystical texts about Jewish women and the feminine principle in Hasidus called Malchus or sovereignty. All the names in the following story, by the way, are pseudonyms, and I call the three women speaking Mushka, Hana, and Sara. So one week at our Torah study, Mushka brought up a recent conversation she had been in with a non-Chabad Orthodox rabbi. He asked her whether the elevation of the feminine in Chabad Hasidic texts has a real world effect on Chabad women. Is it just theoretical, he asked, or do people actually live with these ideas? Mushka relayed her response to us in a tone that implied the answer was obvious. She said, growing up with eight brothers, let me tell you, Chabad men have a lot of re respect for women. In general, I don't think you'll find a Chabad man who doesn't value and recognize how incredibly important his wife is. But Hannah chimed in and said, but it's not perfect. 
we are still in Gullis, exile, and the feminine is not completely recognized. Hashem's God still says, bring a carbon, a sacrifice for me. So here, Hannah responded to Mushka by alluding to a midrashic source that we had all read at the beginning of our Torah study. In summary, it's a classic source about the feminine in relation to the messianic future. The source speaks about God diminishing the moon, which corresponds to the woman, because she complains that both she and the sun cannot rule the skies. Once she is small, then she complains to God about her lowly position, until he finally relents and says, atone for me. Even though he tries to convince her that in the future, when the time of exile ends, she will be even greater than the sun, he still acknowledges that for a long, long time, she will be small. Chana will not settle for apologetics or the notion that Chabad women have reached a perfect level of equality. From the mystical sources themselves, she argues, we know that we are still not there. We have to acknowledge that women are still the smaller light. Chana brings in the example of women not being able to sit on a rabbinic court as a judge or be a witness in a case of Jewish law as ways that Chabad women are still limited or Jewish women in general. It's interesting to keep in mind that this is a Chabad shlucha, a rabbitin, a very religious woman who's putting forward these arguments. So now instead of defending traditional Judaism, we're sitting around this table, all these women were debating or we're debating these topics. So now Sara jumps in and she counters Hannah by saying, the only real physical difference between men and women is that a man cannot have a baby. Her voice rises slightly and she gets more and more excited about this idea, continuing. If a woman comes to me and says she wants to read from the Torah, I say, go for it. I would tell her it's not the spiritual channel that will connect you to God, but she can still do it. Don't tell women they can't do anything. It's just not true. The dynamic here between Hannah and Sarah is that Hannah sees reality from the perspective of the mystical and legal sources, and she uses them to fashion her worldview. Sara comes from long-standing Hasidic ancestry. However, she brings contemporary secular ideas into her understanding of Judaism and outreach. Although she wouldn't be considered modern or liberal to an outsider, but within the Hasidic community, she has a more broad worldview. Hannah and Sara reflect the dual-facing identities of shlokos as both upholders of tradition and subjects in a sense shaped by liberal feminism. Because what are they talking about here in this story? They are consciously reflecting on their own position in their community. Are they equal to men? No, not exactly. Are they valued though? Some say yes, like Mushka, without reservation. And I would say this is the general response that Chabad women would have. But Hannah brings not a feminist argument, but a mystical argument that women are still not completely valued or equal. It's not because of patriarchy or misogyny. It is due to the exilic nature of our reality. The goal is that the feminine will be elevated in the messianic period, which the Rebbe said is occurring now. So there is a sense that the position of women is increasing in value and, pro and prominence, but that process is still in process. As Wexler notes on page 60 in Social Vision, many of the Rebbe's talks about women as social agents actually occurred before the rise of second wave feminism in the 1960s. And yet as the movement for women's liberation grew, the Rebbe's, talk rode, the Rebbe's talks rode that wave of excitement and power in order to bolster a different type of feminism in line with Hasidic values. In the vein of current feminist theory, which is founded on intersectionality and a diversity of voices, I use the term Hasidic feminism to refer to this particular notion of women's empowerment, which I know is a term Rifka has also used. This is founded on the belief that the perfected world we all dream about creating in our lifetimes is actually in the hands of Jewish women to bring to fruition. Since as the Rebbe teaches, they have a unique role in actualizing our world's messianic potential. On the flip side, the more the world moves towards its messianic perfection, the greater the status of women will be. This idea is found in many mystical sources, but I argue it was made into a practical reality by the Rebbe's hijos, his public talks. The shlokas in the story I related embody the complexity of Hasidic feminism. First, they are making times in their busy lives to study Torah with other women. This is a rarity among Hasidic Jewish women, and it is directly related to Rebbe's focus on increasing women's education. Secondly, we see that Chabad women believe that the mystical notion of the rise of the feminine principle is being actualized currently in the Chabad community. And thirdly, and this is my primary argument, the issue that secular feminists have with Orthodox Judaism, some Chabad women also struggle with. However, they believe that these are part of a mystical reality, not a purely social one. So they will ultimately be resolved through a religious process, not a secularizing one. In conclusion, as Wexler cites in the name of Ada Rapport Albert, the Rebbe presented a counter-feminism, not an anti-feminist agenda, but rather an alternative method towards women's empowerment firmly rooted in Hasidic values.
Thank you. Thank you, Chava. Uh, our third and final speaker for this morning session uh, will be Nathaniel Berman, is the Rahel Var Varn Varnigan Professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Brown University in Rhode Island. His remarks will focus on religion and the modern denial of death. Dr. Berman. Good morning, and thank you, Moshe, and thank you uh, for everyone who worked so hard in putting this together. Um, and in particular, thanks to uh, Philip and Ellie for their wonderful book. Um, I want to begin um, with a moment of silence for the 864,000 people who have died so far from COVID-19, including 186,000 Americans. So please join me, just a very brief moment of silence. May their memory be for a blessing. I'm going to put on a, um, my PowerPoint. <laughs> um, the, the modern denial of death and the redemption of nature and Kabbalistic myth. Um, we've all been in many Zoom meetings and webinars and town halls over the last several months. Um, it's only very rarely that anyone mentions why we're doing it. Um, we're doing it against the background of great human suffering, of death, of illness. We're all familiar with it. We've all known people who have been ill. Many of us, alas, have known people who have died during this time. Um, and yet, these kinds of moments of silence are so rare. The modern denial of death. Um, and I want to talk about this in the, in the few minutes that I have. Um, and I will say at the outset that it was, that this talk is inspired by a passage in chapter two of the book um, from the Rebbe's notebooks in Vichy. Um, and I thank Eli Rubin for uh, directing me to the original text and for all of his help. So I wanna start with um, a quote from Walter Benjamin, the great, uh, cultural social critic um, of the uh, pre-war period, pre-World War II period, who died tragically on the Spanish border in fleeing from the Nazis. And he says this in his famous essay, The Storyteller of 1936. Bourgeois society has achieved by means of hygienic, social, private, and public institutions, what may have been its subconscious main purpose to make it possible for people to avoid the sight of the dying. Um, and this idea of the denial of death or oppression of death is something that many observers have noted over the last uh, century or two. Um, famously, uh, Heidegger thought that facing death was key to achieving authenticity. Um, but many, many observers have noted this in a variety of ways. And this is a particularly eloquent uh, formulation of it uh, by Benjamin. Um, and I think we're reliving it today in the face of a very, very striking phenomenon of mass death all over the globe and so little talk of it for those who are not actually uh, frontline workers. One of, the, uh, one of the things I think that religion brings is a reflection on death. And however, uh, that, that's been characterized in many different ways. Um, but it, there's a certain kind of confrontation with this reality um, and a struggling with it. Uh, in our tradition, let's go back to one of the first statements uh, that I think is uh, an expression of a rebellion against death um, by the prophet Isaiah, um, prophesying about the end of the days. He says about God, Bilaha Mavet Lanetzach, he will swallow up death forever. Very, very strong part of um, Isaiah's vision. Uh, the commentators disagree with each other about exactly what this means. Does it really mean there will, there will be no death? Um, there's a lot of uh, disagreement in the commentaries. Uh, this, the plain meaning would be he will swallow up death forever. A certain kind of utopian hope, a rebellion against death, facing death and rebelling against it. I'm going to move very quickly to my uh, 
field of study, which is the, the Zohar, the main work of, of Jewish mysticism from the late 13th century, primarily in Castile, um, that takes this verse extremely seriously. Um, I'm just going to read it in English. The Zohar says, in the time to come, the Blessed Holy One will burn away all the evil species from the world. As it is written, he will swallow up death forever, that verse from Isaiah, and all will return to its place. As it is written, on that day, Hashem, Yahweh will be one, and his name will be one, from the prophet Zechariah. And in this short teaching from the Zohar, you see uh, all the themes uh, that I will then show in the, in the thought of, of Rabbi Schneerson, um, the theme of the connection of death with the demonic, the idea that death is connected to the evil species, which is one of the ways the Zohar has of referring to demons in the demonic realm, uh, that death is associated with the demonic, it is also associated with the world being out of joint. All will return to its place in the end of time. In other words, right now, all is not in its place, that somehow the cosmos itself is dislocated. And also God it will, is not fully unified. On that day, God will be one. And the uh, Zohar is quite clear that the unification of God, the final unification of God is something that only happens in the end of time uh, and this very familiar verse from Zechariah will be fulfilled. So I switch very quickly now to the notebooks of Rabbi Schneerson from uh, 1940 when he was fleeing from the Nazis and in Vichy, the capital of, of French collaboration with the Nazis, um, and really reflecting. And I was really taken with this. This quote is given in part in the book, um, and uh, Ellie directed me to it. It's a short quote. I could talk about it for hours, but I will only talk about it for a few minutes. Um, and it starts off with, well, uh, I'm, I'm actually quoting a little bit out of order to, for my presentation purposes. Um, he says, and Moses was perplexed specifically by the impurity of death, for death indeed is an issue in which there is no benefit and no purpose, right? And this is a very clear statement, the idea that death is something that has no benefit and no purpose, um, and Moses was perplexed by it. Okay, and there's an example of what I mean when I say religion makes you, at least in religious texts, you can face death. Other texts as well, certainly existentialism, but facing death. Death is indeed an issue in which there is no benefit and no purpose. And then he explains that at the beginning there was no death. Adam was created by the hand of the Blessed Holy One. True existence. The whole world too was at this level. In the manner of, and then he quotes a verse from Deuteronomy, you who cleave to Hashem, your Elohim, are alive. Very famous verse. And there was no death in the world in the beginning. So death itself is a product of a fallen world. The beginning of death was through the sin of the tree of knowledge, the opposite of cleaving to God. In other words, there's a kind of a dislocation of the cosmos from God. Death arose as a byproduct and nature was harmed in its essence. The idea of living in a world of fallen nature, which death is a byproduct of a rupture with God, or a rupture in God, for that matter. And then he goes on and says this, indeed, to repair the matter of death, in Yanamita, the harshest impurity, it is necessary to descend to its place in order to raise it up. And measure for measure, the raising up must also be extreme. This idea that in order to do tikkun, to do repair on death, you have to descend to its place. There's no, there's no easy shortcuts, no uh, spiritual bypassing, to use uh, a, a term from today. You have to descend to its place, the lowest low, to confront it in order to raise it up, to confront it, not to skip over it. And then the raising up must also be extreme. And then a, a good deal of this <laughs> very short entry, just a few pages, is devoted to the ritual of the paraduma, the red heifer, and for those of you not familiar with it, complicated and mysterious passage in the book of Numbers in which you have to take a, a red heifer, a pure red heifer, burn it, sprinkle its blood, mix it with water as a way of purify, purifying to matame, the impurity of death. And this is why, he says, we find in this mitzvah, that of the red heifer, the paradox of opposites. 
Why? Because it's confronting death in order to, to, in order to raise up from it. And to give some examples from, the, from, the, uh, from both the verse and from the, the Talmudic interpretation of it, it must be done outside the camp. In other words, and for Kabbalists, that's always a place of impurity. And yet the sprinkling must be in the direction of the Holy of Holies, quoting from the Mishnah, the place of the ultimate holiness, conjunction of the ultimate place of impurity or even the demonic and the Holy of Holies. Red, it has, the red heifer has to be red, as in from this ruddy red stew. That's a reference to the stew that Jacob was stirring when Esau, and Esau came from the field. Um, and the idea was that this is the stew of, of Esau who's viewed as associated with the demonic. In, in, uh, in rabbinic literature, um, it also says that Jacob was stirring the stew because it was a meal to comfort the mourners who were coming back from burying Abraham. So it must be red, again, associated with the demonic and with death, but it must be pure. And also there's a mixture of the ashes of the red heifer with water. And, he, and the, the uh, Rabbi Schneerson says, water descent from on high to the lowest, because water comes down as rain, burning ascent above. So burning, we know that the smoke of burning is something that goes from below to above. It's this conjunction of opposites. That's the paradox. And why is it this paradox? Because of what I said in the beginning. That death is caused by a rupture in the cosmos. It's a product of a fallen world created by the original sin that dislocates nature and death, or death, which has no purpose, he says, emerges as a byproduct. And the only way to defeat death is by this paradoxical conjunction of opposites, but it can only be done if you confront it. And again, I think that's something that's done in religious circles in a way that's often not done in modern society, as Benjamin said. And then the messianic hope, Rabbi Schneerson says, is this is a tikkun for the damage to nature, for the matter of death. Which the idea is to defeat death, not to accept death as a mere natural thing, but it's a product of a fallen nature. And as he says, as in the time to come, as in the ultimate time to come, when death will be defeated, bilaham avet lenetzach, God will swallow up death forever. Facing death, knowing that the only way through it is to confront it, to reunify the universe through bringing together opposites, lowest low, highest high, and we can think of many other opposites of this nature. And that's why I call my talk, The Modern Denial of Death and the Redemption of Nature in Kabbalistic Myth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berman. So I would like to open it up now to begin with from within the panelists, and between the panelists, um, any comments, questions to really begin a, a conversation um, in, in these three really different topics, but all sourcing back to this, this idea of, of what I call excellence. Um, confronting things, bettering ourselves in, in all these different ways. Um, so we'll open up to you guys. And then um, again, if any of the attendees, people watching have questions, um, they can type them in the Q&A. Um, and hopefully we can have a, a, a robust conversation. Um, I can just start off with, it's interesting, I was thinking that we have three very diverse topics um, that we kind of put under this category of spirituality and modern life. Um, but I actually, I just thought, I actually have a personal reflection that really ties together <laughs> what both of you spoke about, um, which is that when I was a sophomore in college, my grandfather passed away and I had an existential crisis at 20. <laughs> and I thought about, and I thought about death and I thought about my life and I thought about what is what is a life worth living um, and as a college student that moment was for me I was in the milieu of college and I, I what resources I have then 
Um, and so I really sought answers in my classes and, and starting to take classes that dealt more with these questions of life and death. Um, and that segued into my interest in feminism, thinking about what can change our world to, um, to make it a better world. And that would be like, you know, my contribution, um, which ultimately then tied into to Judaism for me as, that, as those answers. Um, so I, I had a question for Ben actually about um, kind of the ways that religion looks differently on a college campus than in other parts of a person's life, like someone who's you know, older or they're someone who's married with children, they look to religion for spirituality. Um, are there ways that universities recognize that students need like a different type of spirituality or, or what does that look like? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think over overall, right, I think colleges see themselves as this kind of like profound or grand intervention. And in many ways they, they can be, right? I mean, it's, it's you leave home and, you know, you have a, your brain's developing over four years and there's a lot going on. You're meeting people, you're learning things, life is happening outside of it. And maybe you have to be an adult for the first time in ways that you didn't have to be an adult prior to that, right? Um, so I think like overall, uh, colleges understand that the spiritual and religious dimension is a part of one's identity. Uh, certainly there's great variation between colleges, right, and between experiences uh, uh, there. And, and I think, um, you know, some institutions are very intentional. They really do see spirituality and religion as a form of diversity. Uh, others, maybe, maybe not as much. Um, I think on the scholarly side and some of the projects I'm in, what we've tried to do um, is try to take broader understandings of college student learning and development. So whether it's spiritual identity, moral reasoning development, um, cognitive growth, these kind of things. Uh, in, in that broader research, we've tried to take some of those lenses and really apply them into this dimension of the student's experiences. Um, and so, you know, what does it mean for a student to, uh, what, what are students learning and, and gaining out of these kind of, you know, social experiences in a in a Chabad house, for example, and what does that mean when they kind of go back to their dorm and having that space? What does it mean to kind of have an opportunity maybe to integrate some of what you're learning in the classroom versus what you're doing outside? I mean, interesting to me to kind of bring it together. I was a religion major um, at college, um, and so I didn't get into doing higher ed and all the data stuff until much later. Um, so it was an interesting opportunity for me to kind of bring in what I was learning in the religious studies curriculum uh, alongside kind of my own identity development as a Jew um, through kind of the, the Chabad house was kind of a, the location and meeting point working with Rabbi Gray and, and other students to kind of gain that. So I think in a long way of answering it, it's, it's colleges and college, um, you know, and, and, and organizations, you know, Chabad on campus programs like that very much recognize that there is some huge developmental activity going on during college. And then it's just kind of like what supports can be provided to facilitate and foster that development in, in a kind of meaningful, authentic way. Um, could I jump in here? Um, I, 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 love, I love what you're saying, uh, Ben, and, and, and Chava, thank you for sharing that uh, experience when you were in, in college, a very personal experience. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, one of the things that's going on in college or one of the great things about college students and what makes it a joy to teach them um, is that the best among them, and well, in my, in my view, the best among them are the ones who are, who are it's a time where they can face ultimate questions. Um, and I think that that's a, 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 of course, a time of great joy, of great bursting of hormones, of great life, but it's also a time when the most reflective among them are willing to face ultimate questions. And, and I wanted to, so tell an anecdote from my own teaching over the last few years. I teach a course called Sacred Sites, Sacred Sites, um, and the subtitle is Law, Politics, and Religion, and we talk about Jerusalem, we talk about Native American sacred sites, we talk about uh, the conflict over Ayodhya in India, um, and I have students as their projects. One of their first projects is they have to choose a, a site that's sacred to them and talk about it in class, present it in class. And many of my students are uh, actually proclaim themselves on the very first day. It's a religious studies course. I am not religious. I don't, I'm not a believer. They make that very clear right off. And what, one of the interesting things for me, and something I didn't predict in advance, 
was those students, the ones who proclaim themselves to be non-religious, often the sacred sites that they choose are related to death. They're the, the, the cemetery where their grandparents are buried, or if they have experienced a loss closer, uh, closer to their own peer group, um, sometimes it's a national cemetery. It's interesting to me that for those students who disclaim any relationship to religion, the, the place where they experience the sacred is somehow related to death. And I think it's because it's the tearing away of sort of bourgeois consumer society. It's the place where you have to face ultimate questions. Um, and I think that that's something that is, again, I've only experienced it the last few years since I've been teaching this course, very striking phenomenon of where is the sacred, where is religion in for people who, again, uh, uh, proclaim themselves to be not, be not religious. And I think that it's, it's really a, a, a time when people can, can face those questions. You know, it's interesting that Laurie Santos, psychology professor at Yale, uh, got a lot of press over the last couple of weeks because she said, you know, students coming to campus should realize that some among them may get sick and some may die because of this. Mm -hmm. And he says, and we have to face that. And it's funny, she's known as the happiness professor, but I, I don't know her and I don't know her work, but I've become very interested because although she teaches mostly about happiness, she says, well, we have to face this. We have to be looking right in the face. Um, and I think that's the kind of uh, thing that young people are able of capable of looking at uh, squarely at, at this time in their lives. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting to note that you have sort of original religion, so to speak, is right, is that ancestral, right, the hearth and the home. Uh, and it, it, you know, as try as we may, in a sense, to get away from it, it it's, as you say, Professor Berman, that's, it, it's almost, it's almost uh, genetically <laughs> tied in. Um, Ellie, uh, Ellie Rubin has uh, raised his hand, um, and if he can come on as a as a panelist, and then as soon as Ellie makes his point, then Dr. Lowenthal uh, uh, has a comment on that point also. Ellie. Hi. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. So first of all, thank you all so much for these uh, wonderful presentations. Um, I had a thought um, about the connection between what Nathaniel was saying and what Chana was saying, or what Chava was saying, um, which I think also out of the connection uh, comes a question, which I think is relevant to all three of you. And that is that, um, of course, Nathaniel um, connects death, the emergence of death, to the original sin, to the sin of uh, Adam, which dislocates the world. And of course, that's also very much related to the position of the woman in society. Um, and so I think there, maybe it's a wild thought, but just as the Rebbe uses this formulation uh, with regard to death, there really has no purpose and it's only an, a byproduct of sin, of this cosmic rupture. A uh, similar thought can be applied to the status of women, that this is also um, something that goes back to the very, very beginning uh, and, and is, again, applying the same language, you could say it has no value and it's a symptom, an outgrowth of this dislocation that we have between nature and God. Um, and so that leads me to a third point of connection between opposites as, as the healing of the world, uh, where, where the seed of that, where, where, do, where do you bring different fields of knowledge together? That's, at the, that's on college. The site of bringing together opposites. Uh, uh, ben had a formulation uh, kind of playing on the language in the book, that the, the student is a multitude. Uh, so the, the site of college is where you become a multitude, is where you come, where, where these different uh, ways of thinking, of seeing um, different aspects of, of social being and social and, and, and knowledge come together. Uh, and so my question is, and this is something I think the Rebbe was very much concerned with, is that the secularization of knowledge and the need to sacralize knowledge. Uh, the university is a site of uh, the secularization of knowledge, 
and how do we, in, within the context of the modern university, achieve some kind of resacralization of knowledge as a means to heal the world, as a means to overcome these polarizations, bring the polarities together again. And uh, back, back to you. That's very interesting. Um, it's interesting because I kind of thinking about what you said about the the rupture of that happened in, in the world with the tree of knowledge and then kind of this descent that fell of both the feminine and also life fell into death. Um, it's interesting because I, I struggle with thinking that it has no purpose because um, the way I conceptualize the midrash of the moon being diminished is a descent for the sake ultimately of a much, much greater ascent um, for the time period of this exile to kind of be a seed uncovering and then growing into something else. And I think, um, Dr. Berman, that, that is kind of what you're saying death can provide. Death can provide a, a, a mirror to look at life. And so it does have within it something useful. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what the Rebbe meant in this particular situation that has no purpose. I think that we can derive a purpose from anything, um, but obviously there's, a, there's different ways to look at it. Um, and then the, the resacralization of knowledge very much concerns me in the field of women's studies, which is um, my original field, that, my discipline that I was in, um, because I found it to be as an undergraduate, a place of a lot of spirituality and exploration and asking questions about the self and the nature of women, um, which in, in recent years in feminist theory, a lot of that has been lost. Um, because of, I guess, fears of essentialism and, and a lot of different ways that feminism has very much shifted its focus. Um, but I'm interested in, in my work in, in speaking about Hasidic feminism and thinking about the ways that um, the, the idea of feminism is very useful and important in religious spheres, but as something that has within it um, a sacred mission and, and a, a sacred part of it. Um, Ellie, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I, of course, as you know, that in the in this entry in the Vichy notebooks, he does in fact address the question of women, um, and specifically about uh, the menstrual blood taboo, uh, which he says will be abolished. Quoting a midrash, will be abolished in the messianic era. That in other words, that the that the impurity that uh, Jewish law associates with menstrual blood will be uh, will be eliminated in, 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 the, in the time to come. Um, and so it is very much, you know, it's, it's very much at the heart of this and also suggests some of the, uh, I think some of the broader issues or some of the dangers of the, of the approach and as well as a, maybe a challenge for Chava um, or not, not challenge for Chava, but for the kind of things you're reporting. Um, uh, he also says in the same entry in the notebooks, he says among the things that have no purpose are the demonic, have, have no purpose in themselves, mm. but only sort of as byproducts or to serve some other purpose are the demonic, the sitra achra, and non-Jews have no purpose in themselves, um, which for me is a particularly unacceptable uh, perspective. Um, but it shows some of the dangers of this way of thinking of what do you attribute to the fallen world and what do you attribute to uh, uh, things that have a purpose, right? And that is something that for which there is no advanced guarantee, but is obviously subject to debate and to uh, different existential, political, ethical stances. Um, uh, uh, and you know, uh, this this among the your your uh, your uh, the people you studied, Chava, who said. Well, you know, in the fallen world, women have a lower status, but in the time to come, they won't. I mean, the, the question, of course, is, again, what do you attribute to the fallen state of the world and what do you attribute to social restrictions is a question of debate, a, a, a controversial, a debatable, contestable zone, um, and not something that is, uh, or, well, or, or it's hard to tell what is ontological and what is contestable and actually changeable in the here and now. Certainly it seems that biological death is something that isn't changeable in the here and now, um, although certainly the borders of that have been pushed. Uh, the question of the status of women, of course, is something that has changed radically 
uh, thank God, over the last over the last uh, uh, century. Um, and it is a it's it's not always easy to tell. And the danger to the approach that I'm that I've laid out is precisely uh, the debatability of what is ontological and what is socially changeable right now. Um, and I and when I hear debates like of the kind that you uh, put forward, have I always think, hmm. Well, but you could actually change it right now. <laughs> you know, not to wait for the Messiah. Uh, um, anyway, that's. I was wondering what what your response would be, and and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, right, right. I think part of what I say at the end is that um, to change those things in the eyes of the shluchas is to change the fabric of of reality. They're they're interconnected. So to say that we can change society without changing the revelation of God in society um, would be to not ultimately change society. So you could have women be a Diana in the court, but then would that would that like reveal God in the world or not? So in a certain time period, yes, and in this present time period, it wouldn't. Um, and so the question is, who's looking at the ontology, <laughs> right? I mean, what is the Lose Chava. Not sure what's happening here. Um, Dr. Lowenthal, do you want to come on? Unless Ben, you have a, a response to any of that. Um, just, just briefly, and I feel like I'm cutting Chava off. So if she comes back, she can just go back on. Um, yeah. Just. Thanks for that question. Um, I did just want to briefly kind of weigh in that this um, this idea of kind of connection between opposites, right? When we study like how our brains actually change and develop through learning, that's pretty much a big part of it. Is that like we learn to kind of we build actually new networks and we're able to connect things across different spaces. So I have a colleague Jim Barber who studies what's called kind of integrative learning. Can we learn? Can we take a religion class, a physics class, and go to Chabad House and kind of integrate that into some meaningful, meaningful way of of new thinking? Uh, which I think is is kind of interesting to hear. Kind of this you know uh, engaging the paradox of opposites can unlock some forms of learning. Um, but I, I did also want to say, uh, you know, uh, about death and its purpose, and, and maybe not purpose in the, the broader metaphysical teleological sense, but certainly, you know, uh, when we're looking at colleges today, um, it's going, a student is going to die. I mean, that's, to, that, that's going to happen. And for that campus community, for whoever is friends or knows that person, those families, I think that's going to go from I'm looking at a COVID dashboard, these kind of anonymous numbers, and I'm seeing them go up and I'm worried, to a very real, very difficult, very uh, challenging experience very quickly. Um, and I, you know, that that is going to be a moment of confrontation uh, where, where the death of a student is always tragic, but the death of a student uh, through, through this, uh, that's going to maybe encourage other students to kind of reflect and confront death in a way that they may not have been expecting. Um, and so I, I did want to kind of tie that in uh, to, to Dr. Berman's point, uh, because I think that that's going to force a powerful confrontation for our students, powerful learning, uh, and, and, and that's, that's going to be a part of the narrative here sooner rather than later. Um, Dr. Lowenthal. I don't know if he's able to come on or not. Um, Chava, you got cut off in middle. Um, I don't know if you were finished your point or wanted to finish a point, but feel free if that's the case. Sorry, my internet connection is faltering. I'm not sure where you lost me. It's okay. Cool. I can continue. Okay. Uh, okay. Rabbi Lowenthal, please. Okay. First of all, I just want to say thank you to the organizers. And phenomenal putting this thing together. And to Philip and Abby and Michael for writing the book. And, and Menachem and everyone and Moshe. And great to see old and new friends. And Nathaniel and Chava um, and also Ellie. Uh, hi, Ben. <laughs> You're the new friend. 
So uh, I think this is very beautiful. You know, there's a concept, Ein Beit HaMidrash Velo Chidush, that there's no gathering of minds without something new uh, coming up. And um, this putting together of death, or as the Rebbe would call it, the opposite of life. <laughs> uh, he often didn't want to even say the words. Um, and the word death in the Rebbe's vocabulary or in Chabad Hasidic vocabulary covers many, many things, um, uh, which including um, cold seichel, cold rationality, the cold rationality which can lead to the Holocaust and to Stalinism, that's, uh, uh, and can lead to denial of the spiritual in life. Um, um, so, 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 so there's a concept that Chiyat HaMeitin is the idea that the coldly rational mind is infused by Hasidic thinking which enlivens it and it suddenly sees the divine. So there's that aspect, so, so I said it all goes back to the Garden of Eden in a most amazing way. And the whole story of the Torah is about the Garden of Eden and how we get back to before the eating from the tree of knowledge. And by divine providence, these three panelists are all exactly on that focus. Um, obviously, the concept of death and going beyond death, so we come back to the Eitz HaChayim, uh, the Zohar says the problem wasn't that they ate from the tree, tree of knowledge, they should have eaten from the tree of life as well, then they'd have been okay. Um, quoted by the Rebbe Rashab and elsewhere in Chassidut. But, um, and then the way that links to the role of the woman. Instead of the woman, you see, we, we have Rashi's the, the, the picture of creation. The conventional translation is that there's only Adam, and then a rib is cut out of Adam, and that rib is made into Eve. Um, hence the, uh, the old feminist magazine, Spare Rib. <laughs> but, um, but Rashid's depiction is no, Adam and Eve are created as one being, back to back. One side Adam, the other side Eve. And what God does is separates them, so that now they're able to face each other and be one again. And that beautiful story of the creation of Adam and Eve together, and then they're becoming separate and then joined. It's, it's a very, very powerful theme, and in a sense, it's the central theme of Kabbalistic thinking as well. Now, so then comes the snake eating from the tree of knowledge, and, and Eve being in some way put down, That's, uh, some, in some sense. And so we have the whole paradox of the role of womanhood. You know, the question, what is the role of womanhood? We have the paradox of death. And we also have the paradox of knowledge. Knowledge on campus, what is knowledge? There's an intriguing, very obscure and very fascinating passage at the beginning of the Rambam's Guide for the Perplexed, where he considers the question how could it be that disobeying God led to greater knowledge than you had before? So it's as if through disobedience you, you came to a higher level and the Rambam uh, wipes this question off the board, but he doesn't actually give any real explanation that I can see. And here we have the question of knowledge. What do people go to college for? Do they go to get what in Hasidic terms is called knowledge and what we've called, what Eddie called before, you've all, the sacralization, what uh, social vision called, the sacralization of knowledge. University should be a place where a person goes beyond the limitations that they had from home, as Ben, you put it uh, very nicely, that uh, the home gives them a certain local um, uh, perspective on the world, and then they go beyond that, and that world, you know, there's a Weltanschauung, they, they suddenly see things in a bigger way. But what kind of way does that move? And so very often that is a, a challenged way. Now, just to put this together with the way the challenge of modernity is a very interesting thing. I think Nathaniel alluded to the idea of, well, of course, with Walter Benjamin's piece, 
bourgeois man, particularly in the age of enlightenment, cannot face death. He excludes, like he excludes many aspects, you know, putting um, 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 certain kind of uh, spiritual person whom he called a lunatic, you know, locked them away in, a, in, in an asylum, you know, whatever is too much, it can't be on the table in front of you. And so, whereas medieval man, cruel as he might have been, he, he faced death. death. Death was part of his life. It, it's, uh, it was there. Modern man can't face death. Or he fa uh, the ultimate of that is Eichmann, who when he saw the primitive way that they were killing Jews by lining them up against, uh, along a ditch and then shooting them and they fell dead into the ditch, he was sick. And the soldier who was support, who had to support him because uh, he nearly fainted, Eichmann took it, um, it, it, was, it was a terrible thing to see. He had to create the gas chambers, which would give a much more clean kind of uh, way of killing. And modern man is challenged also, or the, or the whole process of modernity, and especially as modernity relates to womanhood. When we look at studies of medieval womanhood, um, uh, the uh, Chava Weissler's writings, uh, Chava Tuniansky's writings, uh, um, a Gluckel of Hamelin, you know, we see very strong women who are very, very confident about what they're doing and where, what their place is in the world. But it's in the modern world that a woman thinks, you know, if men read the Torah, so I want to read the Torah. It's, you know, what makes you more of yourself if you're doing something that someone else is doing? To learn Torah is a different thing. So, so, so it's being what one is. Now, maybe in the time of Messiah, women will read from the Torah in public and, and that will be fine. But if so, then fine. So knowledge, death, and womanhood are all somehow challenged by the process of modernity or, or, or they become vattle dig. They're into the one, one is insecure about them. And then comes the Rebbe transforming it, going on, <laughs> That in fact, it's, yes, it's very good. You know what? College, which is a place of kfira, of, uh, of atheism, is exactly the place where you can discover Judaism and you can discover a more spiritual approach to life. Womanhood is actually the ideal in the most tremendous way. And bila hamavet lanetza, death will be swallowed up forever. So it's, uh, I find it very beautiful the way you three have presented it, um, this, this way in which there's this a tremendous transformation from the challenge. It's like Galut and Gula. And the effect is that the redemption is far greater than it was before the state of Galut. So, if you... Thank you, Dr. Lowenthal. Um, so we are uh, right running up against our time. It's now 12.14. Uh, I'm, I apologize to, to those questions we did not get to, uh, but hopefully we'll have more time in, in following sessions. Um, but uh, thank you all for being here and for a final, Jonah, did you want to say anything? Um, okay, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Uh, such a fascinating panel. I had a great time listening. I'm so excited that, uh, that it worked out and that everyone was able to, to participate. Um, we're going to close the Zoom room now, right after I finish talking, um, until 1.30 when our next panel will be. Um, that panel is, let me just make sure, it is Interconnectedness and Hasidim's Social Ethos. Um, and actually, Chava is going to be moderating that. So if you're excited about what she's been talking about, please join us again. Um, and then that will close, and we'll have another session this afternoon at 3, which I will be moderating. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time after uh, that one ends for people if they want to join the Zoom room and, and schmooze and, and, and hang out. Uh, yeah, so please join us again at 1.30 on this link. And uh, thanks everyone so much for joining us. Cool.
great. I think that there are still some people there on the attendees that are leaving now. And I stopped the live stream. So Perfect. well done. That was really great. Yeah, so that went that went beautifully. Very nice. Stop the